Your Honour, I call Andrew Collins. Will you take an oath in the Bible or an affirmation? Affirmation, please. <coughs> Would you repeat after me, please? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You take a seat. Would you tell the Royal Commission your full name? My full name is Andrew Dennis Collins. Uh, Mr Collins, you've made a statement to assist the Royal Commission dated the 29th of April this year? Correct. The contents of that statement true and correct? They are. Uh, I tend the statement. Read Exhibit 2825. Thank you. Uh, Mr Collins, I invite you to read the statement as signed by you, uh, which is 13 pages long. Okay. My full name is Andrew Dennis Collins. I was born in 1968. I am currently 46. I was born and raised in a very devout Catholic family. We prayed the rosary every night and we went to Mass every week. My family have always had great respect for the church and its clergy. We believed that priests, brothers and nuns were closer to God. In 1974, when I was five years old, I started going to Forest Street Primary School in Wendaree, which is northeast of Ballarat. My family lived about a block away from the school. My grade four teacher at Forest Street Primary School was Robert Hastings. He was a Seventh Day Adventist. I think I must have been the only Catholic child in the class. He used to tell me that Catholics were evil that they will go to hell because they worship idols and have statues in their churches and that sort of thing. I think he picked on me because I was Catholic. One day when I was in grade four, he anally raped me at school. I remember going home and taking underwear out of my drawer, getting changed and taking the underwear that I had been wearing that had blood on it back to school and throwing it in one of the bins there. I never told my parents what happened. Mr Hastings said that if I told anyone, the same thing would happen to my younger sister, who also went to school at Forest Street. I was also afraid that if I told my parents, they would think I had done something wrong and I would be punished. In 1980, when I was 11 years old, I started preparing for my confirmation. Because I wasn't at a Catholic school, a priest from the local parish used to come to my house or take me to the local church to give me religious instruction to prepare for confirmation. My family never went to the local Catholic church. Instead, we went to St Mary's Redemptorist Monastery in Wendaree. But for some reason, the local priest, Father X, from the parish Our Lady Help of Christians in Wendaree, was the only one who instructed me for my confirmation. One day, Father X came to my house to instruct me. In the carport at the front of my house, Father X hugged me. As he hugged me, he put his hand down the back of my pants and digitally raped me. He told me that I was a bad child and I would go to hell and that my parents would be so disappointed in me. Again, I just could not tell my parents about the abuse for fear of being punished. Thankfully, I made my confirmation soon after that and never had to interact with Father X again. In 1979 and 1980, I was an altar boy at the St Mary's Redemptorist Monastery in Wendaree, which was where my family attended Mass on the weekend. For some reason, I also had to be an altar boy for Bishop Mulkerns whenever he did Mass at the Cathedral in Ballarat, even though that wasn't where my family went to Mass. Bishop Mulkern's vicar general at the time was Father Brian Finnegan. I remember Father Finnegan used to follow Bishop Mulkern's everywhere. One afternoon, I was invited to go to the Redemptorist Monastery by one of the brothers. He asked my parents if I could go and he said he would show me around the place. 
My mother had this wonderful dream that I was going to become a priest, so she agreed. She would have been so proud to have a son as a priest or as a member of a religious order. My mother dropped me off at the monastery one Saturday afternoon. There were two brothers there, Brother Andrew, who I really liked, and Brother Adrian. The Redemptorists only used their first names, so I do not know their last names. Brother Adrian showed me around the monastery. He took me to an area beside the altar, which only had a few seats in it. He told me that he was taking me there to show me how to ring the bell properly. He raped me there. Then he told me that the pain and that pain and suffering was the way to get closer to God and that what happened would get me closer to God. He told me that my parents would not understand. After this, my parents picked me up. My mother was excited because I had been given a book on joining the Redemptorist Brothers and I remember my father saying, this is something you know that you should really consider. Your mother would be so proud. After this, the Redemptorist Brothers would ask me if I'd like to come back to the monastery on weekends. I used to say, we're busy or we're going away. I tried to keep away from Brother Adrian as much as I could. After I was abused by Brother Adrian, I started stuttering very badly. I was taken to a speech therapist who gave me exercises that were supposed to be subtle things. I was very intelligent at school, but my handwriting was very bad. I ended up going to Wendery High Technical School for Year 7. It was a pretty rough school and I hated it there. I only went to Wendery High for a term and then I set a scholarship to go to St Patrick's College in Ballarat. I got the scholarship and was transferred to St Patrick's when I was 12 for the rest of Year 7, which was called Form 1 at St Patrick's. I loved St Patrick's. It was academically strong. Sport was good and I had a lot of close friends. It was run by the Christian Brothers and it was very, very strict. It was also very religious. We had to pray at the start of every class and go to Mass each week. We also had to do a subject called Religious Education. By the time I had started at St Patrick's, I had no doubt that I didn't believe in God but I had won the annual academic prize for religious education three times while I was there. In 1983, when I was 14, Brother Peter Toomey arrived at St Patrick's. He was my Form 3 class teacher. Brother Toomey was friendly and nice and was like a real father figure. I did well in the subjects he taught. He had a little dog, Russ, that would follow him everywhere. I loved animals and I always used to go and play with the dog. One day Brother Toomey called me out of class and sat me down in the corridor, which was empty. He said, look, I've noticed that you've started shaving. You probably notice your body is going through a few other changes and at lunchtime or after school, I'll be in my dorm if you want me and I'll, I'll explain more to you. He put his hand in between my pants and started fondling me. I choked up and was mortified. He just walked back into the class with a big smile on his face. I went home and told my parents that Brother Toomey had sexually abused me. My mother said, how dare you make up lies about a Christian brother? He's a man of God, as if he would do anything like that. She told me that he was a wonderful man and that he didn't make up lies about a Christian brother. He's a man of God as if he would do anything like that. The next day, I went back to school and spoke to my homeroom teacher, Brother Shane Lavery. He was young and friendly, and I got along very, really well with him. I went back to school and spoke to my homeroom teacher, Brother Shane Lavery. He was young and friendly from him because he's a pervert. And that was it. He never mentioned it again. The next week, Brother Toomey called me out of class again and proceeded to do the same thing. I jumped up and said, keep away from me, you poofter. He got up and walked back into the classroom and then everything changed. He became the nastiest guy. I was in trouble constantly and I was always being punished. 
he used to call me up to the front of the class, told me to put my hands out and struck me with the gat, which was a thick leather strap. Every time I played sport after school, I had a shower afterwards. Brother Toomey used to walk into the shower and inspect me for mud. I had to hold my arms up, turn around and bend over in front of him. I saw him do this with a handful of other boys as well. He was just a living nightmare, but unfortunately I couldn't get away from him because I had classes with him. That year, I really started acting up. I decided that I needed to show that I was tough so that everyone knew that I wasn't okay and that I wasn't weak. In sport, I went in hard and I started to get into fights. Before this, I was not violent at all. My marks dropped and I was caught shoplifting. It was the worst year of my life. While I was in Form 3, some boarders in my year were caught selling pornographic books to other students. Brother Toomey investigated and drew up a list of 10 students who were involved. I was placed third on that list of students. The other students told Brother Toomey that I wasn't involved, but he didn't listen. My parents were called into the school and I was threatened with expulsion. The only reason I was allowed to stay was because I had... Brother Toomey then took us for sex education classes. For the rest of that year, he told me that I would end up marrying a slut, that I wouldn't know who the father of my children was and that I would go to hell. My mother didn't talk to me for three months. Brother Toomey left St Patrick's after that year and things started to go back to normal. My marks improved drastically the next year. While I was at the school, I was approached by both Redemptorists and the Christian Brothers, who asked me to consider joining their orders. I briefly contemplated this to please my mother, as it would have made her very proud, but there was no way it was going to happen. After school, I moved to Melbourne and became a workaholic. I worked long hours, and by the time I was 19, I had six promotions as a young assistant manager of the company I worked for. After a while, I decided to go to university at night because I had nothing to do in the evenings. I used to try and keep busy. I never drank and I always had to be in control. I couldn't relinquish that control ever. When I was 23, my father asked me to come and help with his transport business because he wasn't coping very well. I took a massive pay cut and came back to Ballarat. Looking back, I think I did it because I really wanted my parents' approval. I still went to church every Sunday, not because I believed in God, but because I wanted to be happy. I worked for my father for 15 years and never took a single day off in all this time. In about 2006, the media reported that Brother Toomey had been charged and sent to prison. At the same time, there was media reporting of Brother Robert Best and Father Gerard Risdale cases. I was also having some business problems. Then my son commenced secondary school, and as he reached the age when I was abused, I began to have nightmares about him being abused. I started to really struggle. It was taking me a lot longer to get work done, and I began to get constant headaches. Looking back, I can see now I was having a breakdown. Things just kept getting worse and worse. One night, I ended up on top of Mount Bunningyong, which is close to our home, with three police cars talking me down from jumping off the fire tower there. One night, I ended up on top of Mount Bunningyong, which is close to our home, with three police cars anymore. I just couldn't do it. I've tried to kill myself three more times after this. The last time I tried to kill myself was in 2007. I hung myself at home and my wife cut me down. During this time, all these memories were starting to come back. I knew that stuff had happened, but I'd just buried it all. Eventually, I was starting to deal with this stuff and I went to a party and ended up sitting next to Peter Blankhine. 
We started talking and our lives were just so similar. He told me that he had also been a workaholic. There had been a big crash when everything came back to him. Peter said that he knew a couple of other guys who had been sexually abused as children by Catholic clergy. I met with these guys sometime later and it was like I'd found a family. These guys had been through the same stuff and they understood exactly what I was going through. At this time, I started having intense, intense therapy. I saw a psychiatrist weekly for psychotherapy, the psychologist fortnightly, and my general practitioner monthly. After a period of a couple of years, I'd recovered most of the details of the abuses that I had always repressed. I had always known that something had happened, but I'd closed. After a period of a couple of years, I'd recovered most of the details of the abuses that I had always repressed. The Corners program had contacted one of them and said, look, we want to do a story about some of the abuses in Ballarat. They asked if I would like to come along, and I did. I appeared briefly on the show called Unholy Silence, which was screened in June 2012. When my family saw the show, they said, you've shamed the family and the church by coming out and saying this. This is not stuff you should talk about. It was so long ago, and if anything did happen, which we don't believe it did, then you just need to get over it. After this, I started speaking to the media more. Peter Blankhine and I became spokesmen for a group of local survivors, and every time we spoke to the local newspapers, radio or TV, people rang us. My number is not listed, but people would find it and ring me. Our group of survivors started growing. The more I spoke out, the more my family turned away. A journalist from the Ballarat Courier told me that my mother went to their office with my sister one day and said that if they published my name in the paper anymore, she would sue them. She said I was a liar who had put everything up and was destroying their reputation. My father later told me that on the same day my mother also went to the police station and told them that they shouldn't listen to anything I had said. She even went and spoke to someone at the Ballarat City Council, even though they had no My father, for a long time, was the only family member who spoke to me, but we never talked about anything relating to child sexual abuse. One day my father told me that my mother had said that if I was prepared to write a letter saying that I had made everything up and that none of the abuses had happened, and if she could put this in the local paper, then I could be part of the family again. I said, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Later on, my I could be part of the family again. I said, I'm sorry, that's not going to happen. Every time you're in the paper and you've got it all wrong. The church has nothing to be ashamed for, and you need to stop this. I told him that wasn't going to happen, and he stopped speaking to me as well. My family has had nothing to do with me since. I've literally lost my whole family to this. Not just my sisters and parents, but aunts, uncles and cousins. They don't even talk to my wife and children. I find that part so hard to get over. major depression, post-traumatic stress, social anxiety, relationship issues, insomnia, excessive ruminations and worry. I now take medications and I have it multiple times. I have many reports saying that I will never be able to work again or if I do it will only be part-time and something of a repetitive nature. This upsets me greatly because I have always been a high functioning person and had planned on having a long successful career in business or politics, which is now not possible. In some ways though, I was lucky. When I stopped working, I was eligible for some work cover and insurance and I was given a 30% permanent incapacity certificate. I am aware that many other survivors rely only on the disability pension. 
Most days, my brain just does not work. When things are good, and I can literally do anything, and that can be followed by three or four days where I struggle. On those bad days, I struggle to get out of bed. It can be a nightmare to do something as simple as reading a newspaper. I never know which day is going to be a bad day. It's not a rational thing. I don't think you can approach child sexual abuse and come to terms with it as an adult. I've heard other survivors say that when they try and deal with it, the child they were at the time of the abuses comes out. This is my experience as well. I have now put in a complaint to the police about Brother Toomey and Father X. I didn't report Mr Hastings because I know he is dead, nor Brother Adrian because I think he would be dead as well. I didn't disclose this stuff until my, to my wife until a few years ago. It was confronting for her to find out that I had been sexually abused as a child. My wife had to cut me down when I tried to hang myself in our family home. She had to deal with the ups and downs as a child. My wife had to cut me down when I tried to hang myself in our family. This has had a huge impact on her. She's had to go to counselling to get through it. Our marriage has suffered and we've had to undertake marriage counselling. I should have been earlier this year due to family violence issues. We also broke up the marriage ended for a while. and why their dad is on the front page of the paper. My wife and I sent them for some counselling to make sure they're OK. My children have had to grow up without grandparents or extended family on my side. I am lucky to have my wife and kids. I know other guys in our cars and men's group who don't have them. So every relationship they are in falls apart. Having my family and a decent income are two protective factors that have made such a difference to me as compared to the other survivors. There are about 140 people or so in our group of Ballarat survivors. Of that 140, I think about half of them don't want to be identified. These people have come forward and spoken to Peter Blankheim or myself, but they do not want anyone else to know what has happened to them. So we have included them as a number on our list of group members. I've had people approach me in the street and tell me they saw me in the media and that they had never told anybody that they had been sexually abused, but that I've inspired them to go and see someone and get help. I have also spoken to a number of guys who were sexually abused as children at St Joseph's Orphanage in Sebastopol, Ballarat. Some of the, these guys have told me that when they left the orphanage, they left Ballarat. They said they will never come back. Some have told me that they have never told anyone about the abuse and it will go to the grave with them. I know that many of these people will never come forward and speak publicly about their abuse. Some survivors have told me that they are scared about the impact on their business if they come forward. I've also spoken told me of the fear and shame of coming forward. They still feel Catholic guilt, which means that you don't speak out against the church. Ballarat is a very Catholic town and the Catholic community is very closed. The Catholic culture is very strong. Coming forward and talking publicly about child sex abuse in Catholic institutions not only has repercussions at the family level, but also at the business and social level in Ballarat. It is these impacts that stop other victims from coming forward. Some of the little towns outside Ballarat are also extremely Catholic. Sometimes the only institutions in these towns are a Catholic church and a Catholic school. I know of survivors in these towns that have spoken out about child sexual abuse. They have told me that after speaking out, they were stood down from clubs where they were lifelong members. It's like they have literally been wiped out of these communities. The deaths are a massive issue. 
I know of 10 victims of child sexual abuse in Catholic institutions in Ballarat who died last year. I knew some of them personally. These figures aren't getting any better, and I believe the suicides are just going to keep happening. As a Catholic, you are told that if you take your own life, you don't go to heaven. Instead, you burn forever in purgatory. There are still some parts of Catholic cemeteries where you can't be buried if you have committed suicide. A strict Catholic family would not want it known that their child had committed suicide. Newspapers don't report suicides, so the public doesn't hear about the broken families and their shattered lives, about the unseen impact of institutional child sexual abuse. Children are left behind and they don't understand why. It doesn't end when the abuse ends. Child sexual abuse doesn't just tear individuals and families apart. In my experience, it claws, its claws reach into the community as well, whether they know it or not. In early 2013, Peter Blenkine and, and I met with Bishop Paul Bird. We were looking for some sort of financial compensation to help other survivors, even if it was just to help them survive the, the week. We knew that some of the guys were just in so much difficulty and struggling to pay for things like medical We asked Bishop Bird to pay for the difference between the disability support pension and the pension paid to return servicemen. The difference was 252 a week. Bishop Bird told us that the church had to pay that amount to every survivor, the church would go bankrupt. Bishop Bird told us that we were intent on destroying his church. He said, Andrew, you need to understand something. The church has endured for thousands of years, and in another 40 years or so, you people will all be dead, and this will be forgotten about. And the church will endure for thousands of years more. Peter Blenkine and I decided that if we looked at the diocese as a church, we would be bitterly disappointed. We decided to look at it and deal with it as if it was a business. At this time, the Victorian parliamentary inquiry was underway, and Cardinal George Pell had given evidence that the church was paying for some of the medical expenses of survivors. Peter Blenkine and I spoke to some journalists about this, who then interviewed someone from the Diocese of Ballarat. The diocese had said to the media that they would pay for the medical expenses of some of the survivors. After this, the Diocese of Ballarat did start paying some medical expenses for some, some of the survivors. As far as I'm aware, they are the only diocese in Australia doing so. I would like just to add to that that Mark Bromley and Shane Wall have been extremely helpful every time that we've approached them, and we are grateful for that. A few years ago, I had never heard of the Centre Against Sexual Assault in Ballarat or CASA. I first heard of it when Peter Blankhine and I spoke to a survivor who was going to a men's group at CASA. We looked into it. Since that time, Peter and I have worked closely with CASA and we now refer any survivors we come across to CASA. CASA are absolutely fantastic. In my experience, the staff understand survivors and have empathy and real world, real world experience. They care. CASA specialises in sexual abuse, and in, in my experience, victims of child sexual assault often have very similar experiences later in life. Having specialisation is crucially important. The CASA men's group is also incredible. It is now expanded to include men who are victims of fam familial abuse. I know some victims drive several hours to get to CASA. I think the men's group helps normalise their behaviours. The atmosphere at CASA also feels safe. I know it can be hard for men to come forward and take part in something like that, so the atmosphere is really important. Peter Blank and I made a heart about the Royal Commission's upcoming public hearing in Ballarat, which listed CASA's phone number. We had these left at pharmacies and other places around Ballarat. I hope that this might help other survivors who have never spoken about their abuse to come forward and get some support. I also hope that this Royal Commission will make it more acceptable to talk about child sexual abuse and will help other people to come forward. Peter Blankine and I worked closely with another group in Ballarat moving towards justice. However, I have become somewhat disenchanted with the group. 
In my view, they are very good people who mean well, but they come from a very church-focused background and their work hasn't always resulted in the best things happening. In June 2014, Peter Blenkine and I wrote a submission to the Royal Commission about redress schemes for survivors of child sexual abuse. I also helped put together the submission of the Ballarat and District Survivors to the Royal Commission. I think there has to be a three-pronged approach for redress in relation to child sexual abuse survivors. Firstly, there needs to be a caseworker who can assess survivors and liaise with various government agencies. The Victorian Government has budgeted for a trial caseworker for the next four years in Ballarat, and this will take place after the next state budget that actually has been put into place. Secondly, there needs to be compensation for the past. This needs to be a process. It shouldn't be adversarial. Finally, there needs to be ongoing payments that allow survivors to access decent medical treatment. I'd like to highlight that again. There needs to be a payment for the past, for past pain and suffering, and ongoing payments to allow survivors to access decent medical treatment and care. If you look at the systems that are in place for returned servicemen who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, and those in place for survivors of child sexual abuse who suffer from PTSD, there is a huge difference in payments and services, even though the effects suffered by both groups are similar. It could be argued that at least returned servicemen had some understanding of what they were getting into, whereas as children we had no choice. I call for the immediate introduction of a child related illness, sorry, of a clergy related illness and redress scheme. I understand that there can be arguments as to whether it is a state or a federal issue, but please don't let victims continue without support. For the sake of our families and those who support us, we need to be here. We need to stop the premature deaths. has further evidence that he is likely to give early next week, uh, so he should not be excused from his summons. Does anyone have any questions of him at the moment? No, thank you, Mr Collins. You heard what Ms Vanessa said. You're not excused. Thank you. We'll see you next week.